Hello people, I got an email the other day that I want to share with you. I've noticed people like to announce aspects of their life to the world. Coming out, relationship statuses, gym memberships. I've also noticed that for the most part, Zen people do not do that kind of stuff. Is there something in the philosophy where Dogen, you, or anybody talk about the subject of sharing or oversharing aspects of one's life? Well, dear reader, I don't know of anywhere in Dogen's writings or in the writings of the Buddha or anywhere else where they explicitly talk about this phenomenon of oversharing. I think it's a particularly American thing, and I'll tell you my little story around it, which is I went to Japan in 1993, and one of the greatest things I discovered really early in my being in Japan was that I was no longer required to share about my life. Japanese people don't expect it. And in fact, if you do it, uh, they'll get uncomfortable about it. And you'll know pretty quickly that you've kind of crossed a social barrier by just telling too much about yourself. And I loved that. I loved it dearly. I don't know why I might not be like a normal American in this respect, but it could be those four years of my childhood living in Kenya that, that did it, or it could be something about my personality or whatever. But I don't like sharing all these aspects of my life with other people. I don't like having to have an opinion about everything. It really bugged me that in workplaces and in just relationships in general, I would be expected to forward my opinion about, you know, whatever the subject of the day is or, or uh, you know, politics or, or any of that. I just wasn't into it and I wasn't into talking about my love life or, or anything else. There's plenty, I think, interesting for people to discuss without going into these areas. So this might be a specifically American phenomena. And I think it accounts for a lot of the things I'm uncomfortable with in American Buddhism. I see American Buddhism putting forward a lot of identity issues and the magazines and the websites and the online forums and whatever else you find seem to me to be overly interested in these aspects of identity, and especially when it comes to identity politics and all of that stuff. And Perhaps the reason that Japanese culture doesn't value this might be related to Buddhism, because if you think about Buddhism, what we are interested in is getting to a core of ourselves that has nothing to do with what we usually think of as ourself. When we usually, say, describe yourself, you're going to talk about your wants and desires, your likes and dislikes, the color of your hair, the color of your skin, maybe, um, your history, uh, all that kind of stuff. And Buddhism regards all of this stuff as being really superficial, surface level stuff. Stuff that ultimately doesn't matter. There is an idea of so-called big self and small self. This is comes from the terms used by Suzuki Roshi, Shunryu Suzuki, the author of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, and has been co-opted by Genpo Roshi for totally different purposes. So forget what Genpo Roshi says about big self or big mind. What Suzuki Roshi was talking about when he talked about small mind or big mind and small self or big self, I believe he used the terminologies uh, fluidly, but I'm not really sure. But the idea of the big self is something that transcends all of your personal identity. Like all of your personal identity is largely irrelevant to this big self concept and small self is something else. So when people in America are talking about finding themselves, what they're doing usually is trying to find the small self, you know, this little tiny personal self. Now, having said that, I will say that there is a relationship between the small self and the big self. And one of the ways I like to describe this is that I think one way of looking at the small self aspects of what we are 
is that the small self might be like a puzzle piece. A puzzle piece, in order to be effective as a puzzle piece, has to be a certain shape, a certain size, a certain color. It has to have certain characteristics, right? Certain individual characteristics to make the puzzle complete. And I feel like that's what small self is. Small self is a certain set of characteristics that help to complete a bigger puzzle, which is everything, the all, you know, everything, the big self, the big mind. And so in order for that puzzle piece to successfully complete the puzzle, it has to be exactly what it is. But finding out exactly what that puzzle piece is, is in itself a, a difficult task. It's not the obvious things. And the obvious things about that puzzle piece self, that small self, are all the things that you normally discuss. Your wants and likes, your desires, your fears, your personal history, your sexual orientation, your race, your gender. All of that stuff is superficial level stuff as far as Buddhism is concerned. It's not completely inconsequential, but it's not what we're after in Buddhism. And if you're going to do a successful Zen practice, successful being a kind of dirty word anyway, but let's leave that aside for a moment. But if you're going to do this the way it ought to be done, you, you need to kind of put that stuff aside. And especially when you're in the setting in which you are going to engage in Zen practice, it is important to put that stuff off to the side. Doesn't mean you get rid of it or, or, or throw it away means you put it off to the side. There's a line which I will not be able to remember exactly correctly, but it comes up in Shunryu Suzuki's book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And it was really important to me, and I'll tell you it the way I remember it. The way I remember it is, he says, if you are going to do this Zen practice, it's like cleaning out your house. You have to take everything out of your house. And he says at the end of saying all this, that maybe at, after you've done this, there might be some things you want to bring back in, but first you have to take all of it out. And I know exactly what he's referring to now, having lived in Japan for a number of years, but I didn't know this when I was first reading the book, which is that it's a tradition in Japan to do this thing called osoji, which means big cleaning. And you do this generally during the New Year's season. Up until a few years ago, it's begun to change. Most people had about a week off of work and whatever else they were doing over New Year's, over January 1st, because the Japanese celebrate uh, uh, New Year's on January 1st, unlike the rest of Asia, which does it on the Lunar New Year. Don't say you never learned anything from this channel. So you have five days off, generally, five to seven days off. And during that time, one of the things that people do, and I saw this happen a lot, uh, is, is they literally take everything out of their house and do a major cleaning. And that, I think, is what Shinru Suzuki is referring to. And then when you do that, you discover all the junk you have, and you usually end up throwing a lot of it away. And that's the kind of thing that we're doing in Zen practice. We're kind of taking everything out and then seeing what is actually necessary to be what we are. And some of us do it more successfully than others. I'm, I'm one of the unsuccessful ones, probably. But some people who are good at it can get rid of almost everything and bring almost nothing back. But, you know, <laughs> some of us don't fare quite as well. But we're trying. Well, at least I'm trying anyway. So that's my thing about that. And I hope maybe that was useful to you. If you want to donate to me, the PayPal and Patreon links are below. As I always say, I don't make much money from book royalties and speaking fees. But most of my money comes from you folks donating. And thank you very much for those donations. It really helps a lot. See you next time.